Good afternoon, greater Philadelphia area. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB, 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time, and she's Stacey Mitchell. And we've got special guest, super agent, team member Zara Salah in the house. Thanks for coming on. And again, we all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group with Remax Mainline, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And where we're going to start the show off, and reminder, we're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, streaming every single week. Make sure to subscribe, follow us, just look up Tom Tool Sales Group. So interesting news coming out of the holiday weekend here. And to me, this is good news because it seems like the Fed is finally getting what they want because mortgage demand is up for the third week in a row as rates have continued to ease. So this comes from the MBA, the Mortgage Banker Association's weekly mortgage application survey. It showed demand for purchase loans was up by a seasonally adjusted 3% last week compared to the week before, but down 41% from a year ago. No surprise there. We all know it's a little bit of a different year in 2023. So ladies, what do you think about all this? What does this mean for the market? What's the outlook like? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is great news. Um, we've been hoping that this is where things would go. I know we never know until the numbers come out where things are actually going to land. We've been wondering, you know, we know another rate hike is is probably coming. It sounds as though it's not going to be as high as what they were initially predicting. Um, but this is this is good news for buyers and for sellers. Um, so I'm I'm excited. Yeah, I loved seeing this article <laughs> because it, it proves what I'm feeling out there. People are more optimistic. So for me, um, this is great news, great news for our clients. Um, it, it's going to be very positive going into the new year. I would say, I mean, I agree with a lot of consumers, even those that are in, you know, actively looking, um, you know, that are buyers, not necessarily knowing right where rates are. So mm -hmm. I would say this has been an opportunity to kind of educate them and let them know what's really going on. Like, yes, we have seen this dip. I don't know that it's going to get significantly better than this in the the near future, but it's an opportunity to kind of show them this is because they're very quick to bring up. Well, what about the 3% rates, which like yes. are gone, like bye. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, to kind of show them this is where they were. This is where they went. This is where they are now. This is historically how they've looked. Um, and so the, the position that we're in right now really is not is not bad. I love how you broke that all down mm -hmm. so simplistically. Mm -hmm. This is where we are now. This is where we were. This is, you know, right. and historically where it was. Mm -hmm. I think that um, educating the consumer and they can actually understand that, hey, it's really not that bad. Mm -hmm. And comparatively speaking, if I'm renting, you have no other choice than to purchase. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have to purchase. It's the biggest investment that you're going to make, and you have to get in now. Now's the best time. So I think just getting out there and, and, and showing all this information to our buyers has been, it's been great for me to, to show people uh, what's really happening. And they're very receptive to it. Mm -hmm. And they, seeing the evidence, then they can shut out all the noise. Mm -hmm. And they can move forward being confident in, in their next steps. So Zara, what are you seeing? You've been on the forefront here. I know you were you were able to reactivate some folks uh, right when the rates came down. So how has that affected your business, and how has that affected consumer sentiment? Yeah, I agree. So I completely agree with what Stacey said about just them being more optimistic about the market. In October time, you know, the interest rates were 7% higher, and I feel like that scared people in November time because they were like, oh, maybe they're going to get even higher than that. But now with the interest rates going down, I feel like people are becoming more optimistic, which is making them come back to the marketplace. Well, and I, some of these people, their, their situation hasn't changed, yeah. right? Like, they still have a need to, to transact. And obviously, you know, taking a break from the market while things kind of settle out, especially during that hotly contested election, which I'm clear had a lot to do with this. Yeah. Uh, so that, 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 that's a really good observation. But the folks that are motivated are always going to transact. It's not, like, it's not like nothing sold in the month of October. So, you know, w with this in mind, I think the big question is there, there's a Fed meeting coming up in a little over two weeks. What's going to happen at the Fed meeting? Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, predictions out there, which I'll get to in a second. So, and what we've also seen is that the early reports from Black Friday were not great for consumer spending, which has to do with inflation. And that seems to be the target that the Fed has had all, the whole time is getting that inflation down to that like 2% ratio. 
So what do you guys think about what happens at this meeting coming up in a couple weeks? How's that going to play out? What are your predictions there? Or wh- wh- where do you see the, the, the tea leaves reading? Well, I think the feds are still hell-bent on uh, <laughs> crushing our economy. <laughs> uh, that's just how I see it. Um, when I see what they're trying to do and how and the language that they're using, they really want people to be out of jobs. They need the jobs uh, market to, to be different. Um, so they're trying their best to do this. And, and the, the one thing that they're focused on is the housing market because it mm-hmm. has been sustaining through the pandemic. It's been really a huge part of the economy. It is the economy, basically. Um, so I think they're going to raise um, the basis points again. I don't know, though, if it's if the interest rates, if the mortgage interest rates are already baked in at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if it's going to affect it as much as it might have um, had the, um, you know, had the the positive reception with the, the drop in the rates. Um, so we'll, we'll just see what happens. But I think they're going to raise the basis points again. Probably a small one, maybe a half. Um, not a three quarters, I don't think. Yeah, my guess is going to be um, half, like 50 basis points um, is kind of where I see I see that going. Um, but I, I also agree with you that like for as far as how that um, affects the mortgage rates, you know, they might, we're probably not going to see like an equivalent mm-hmm. boost um, in that. Well, we didn't see it the last time at the last meeting they had. It, the rates kind of stayed the same. They didn't really move too much. So that I, 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 I think you're both right on there. And your prediction of 50 basis points, Zara, do you got a prediction? Um, well, I mean, we were talking about it a little bit. And also, like, like you said, you know, with the inflation going down, which is what the Fed wants, that's more likely for the interest rates not to go up as well. So they could get lower as well. So there's a, there's a prediction website out there. Yeah. It's called the CME Fed Watch Tool. Um, and... It comes from the CME Group. It's it's literally cmegroup.com. They have a countdown to when the next Fed meeting is, 15 uh, or 14 days, 20-some hours, and 35 minutes. And it, it's, it's, like, it's like the Santa countdown for kids, right? <laughs> so they have a prediction. Uh, it's basically like yeah, like a futures bet, right? So um, it came out last week. Do people week. bet on this? I, I would imagine they would. Stacey, what do you think? They, bet, a betting on expert here, so. they yeah. bet on everything. They bet on it. Because like, I didn't do very well with like my sports gambling this year. I got knocked out week one for my knockout league in the NFL. But maybe I want to put some money on this like interest rate <laughs> thing. <laughs> I don't think the odds would be very good for you, Sarah, based on your prediction. Because the traders that – and, and, and th- this website, it monitors the probability of Fed rate hikes. That's the idea. So – the traders now see a 76% chance of a smaller 50 basis point increase in the federal funds rate at the Fed's final meeting of the year on December 14th. So you get like even money on this. It might be like even when like if you were to bet on the Eagles this weekend, like right. you'd have to put up like $650 to win 100. Right. So I don't know if that would be a, a good value bet, but that's a whole other story. So <laughs> but with that in mind, though, I think I mean, it, it looks like they are easing this and i think the challenge is that this inflation data is always so lagged like it's not like real time like it's always a month or two later and the october data came out you know the middle of november and then all of a sudden rates came down so i think we're going to see kind of the same thing and more importantly i'm really looking at this black friday data because black friday i mean we've all heard the stories like i'm going out at 5 a.m to go shopping happy thanksgiving like it's it sounds sounds miserable uh but that if you looked at what these uh people were doing there was a lot of big sales, like 50, 60, 70 percent off in some cases. And a lot of companies and stores had to do this because the inflation was so high, they weren't hitting their projections. Online sales were between 9 and 9.2 billion on Black Friday. That's slightly ahead of the projection of 9 billion, but it's only a 1 percent increase from last year. So considering inflation's up at 1.89 percent this year, I think 8.2 or 8.4 was the peak. And you're only seeing a 1% increase in the volume of sales. I mean, that, 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 that's, that's down. And that tells me consumers are feeling this. Inflation is trending downward. And this is good news for the housing market, not good news for people that are in the retail sales. Now, but do you think Cyber Monday today will be well, a so bigger hit? Because I know I did not go out Black Friday shopping, but I sent several links today for Christmas presents <laughs> I won. So, and and that, that's kind of baked into this. But the, the online sales, like they, if you looked at um, – I don't think people shop like that anymore, I think there's been, especially since the pandemic. Uh, but they were – 
the online sales for Black Friday, they're comparing it year over year. So not comparing Cyber Monday, but a lot of folks, they, we saw them up there. Like, I mean, I got all these emails over the weekend, like, yeah. this is going to go till Monday because they were already down from people coming out and going shopping. So, yeah. I mean, we'll see what happens, but it, it's, it, I'm seeing some more caution in the market from U.S. consumers uh, because of the highest inflation that we've seen in about four decades. And I, I think that's a good indicator that the Fed will react the way a lot of us think they will. And, only, you know, bring, uh, make make a fifty percent or a fifty basis point, excuse me, increase in in the federal funds rate, and I do think mortgage rates probably stay firm. I don't, I don't think if anything it might go down a little bit. Oh, that would be great. Well, I, I mean, great for us. Well, it'd be great for 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 people in the housing market. So, we just went through all this data here. So, what what does that tell you about the first quarter? Like, what what do we think happens in the first quarter? I mean, we can talk about what's going to happen in the next thirty days. December housing activity is always a little tricky to predict because there's so many people that have this mindset that it's the holidays. I'm not going to move. I'm not. I'm not just not going to do anything. Um, so what? Do, how do we think this affects the first quarter? I think people will be coming out strong in the in the first quarter. Yeah. Um, I because I do think that there are, you know, and we talk about this a lot. Like there is a lot of opportunity here in the next month to to do to transact. Um, but there are going to be a lot of people that pull away and are going to want to you know, get back into it come come January. So I think I think January is going to be a good month. I think there are some folks that are waiting till after the holidays mm -hmm. yeah. to, you know, to do their transactions. So I think after the holidays, you can get a, a renewed burst of people mm -hmm. in January and February that want to get in because they want to um, make their move by springtime. Uh, it seems like to me when I talk to folks that are renting, their leases are up in April, May, June. Mm -hmm. So I know there's going to be a lot of movement then. So it's it's just um, it's going to be interesting to see where the mortgage rates uh, fall into early new, into the new year um, to see if it's going to it's going to turn people off. If it goes back up mm -hmm. into the sevens, I think there's going to be a little pullback. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think that seven mark is really hard for people. Mm -hmm. It's that yeah. it's that seven, you know. Yeah. Under it could be six point nine nine, and they're like, oh, that's okay, you know. Six, right. six is is easier yeah. to digest, but that seven mark, it really uh, turned people off. Yeah. yeah. What's been interesting is there's some predictions out there for not only what happens with rates this year and next year, which we'll get to in a second. Um, historically, we're going to see the first seasonal market we've had in a while, and and what I mean by that is that even this year was a little wonky with the seasonality. Uh, Historically, what I've seen is come like January 2nd, people are just coming out of the woodwork and they're ready to go do things. They're ready to transact. The holidays are over. Um, I, I don't I don't agree with that strategy. If I'm a buyer right now, I want to be looking when other people aren't. And if I'm a seller, I want to be the only option out there when other people aren't because you get that really motivated buyer that's like, I'm getting relocated here in 90 days. This works. So I, I, don't, I don't agree with that strategy. And Warren Buffett, we talked about him last week with uh, Ben Black. He says buy when other people aren't. So I'm a big believer in that strategy. Uh, looking at, at, at that, though, historically, you will see people January 1st, January 2nd, they're coming into the market, new year, new resolution, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so Fannie Mae forecasters, they're expecting um, a slow, steady decline in mortgage rates over the next two years with rates for 30-year fixed loans dropping below 6% in 2024, late 2024. Um, and then the Mortgage Bankers Association uh, they are forecasting a more severe pullback with 30-year fixed rate loans going below 6% in the spring and averaging 4.4% in the second half of 2024. So who was right here? If we're going to bet on this, we're going to gonna turn to a betting show next thing we know here. Uh, you're, you're betting on this. What, what, which, which one is more likely here? Option number one. Yeah, yeah option number one sounded more likely than the other one. I, I think it's, you're going to see hard, be hard pressed until the, they have to decrease the federal funds rate, in my view, for mortgage rates to come back down. Because they did that. The only reason rates went low is because we had a pandemic. They wanted cash in the system and they wanted to spur activity, which worked. Obviously, the housing, we saw the most homes ever sell in 2021. Even after 2021, people kind of got used to, to dealing with that. So I, I, would, I would be a little surprised if they go down that low. Um, I think a lot of it's going to depend on what happens with inflation here. If inflation gets under control, I think we're going to see rates kind of in that, like, I could see fives. I mean, I could, I could see that happening. But 3% was just, it's a little silly. So congratulations to anyone who got a 3% rate because I don't, I don't think it's happening anytime soon. I, I, I totally agree. I like Fannie Mae a lot better than the Mortgage Bankers Association forecast here. I'm, I'm just wondering where they where inflation under control 
it means. What does that mean? They're going well. The I know Fed wants two percent. And I mean that's super aggressive. How are they going to get there that quickly? I, I if it's three to five percent, that's normal, right? I mean, that, you look at how much the housing markets appreciate it historically. It's typically between like two and five percent. Uh, you're not going to see ten percent year over year. And you know, part of this is because the Fed was so aggressive with their rate cuts during the pandemic that created this situation in the first place. So I think they're kind of playing catch up right now. All right. So last question here. Knowing all of this, what should real estate agents be doing now to get ready for the for- first quarter? Because I think there, there's some information here that's important. The month of December is here. What should be their game plan? What should real estate agents be doing now if they want to have that really awesome first quarter with a ton of sales on the books? I think um, there is a couple of different things that that should be being done. One would be to find out if there are people who are ready to do things now um, rather than get out there for the first. So um, making sure to, to be in touch with your clients to see who's ready to kind of get out there now. Um, because come the first, if you line things up right, you could be looking at a lot of showings and a tight, a tight schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, I think getting ahead of not trying to wait until the first to then get in touch with your clients and line up like, so do we need to tighten anything with our search? Do we need to loosen anything with mm-hmm. our search? and to get the background on what's been going on with them over the past couple months. So getting those conversations done now so that when the first comes and when they're ready to actually get out there, you're able to to get out there and kind of hit the ground running. And I guess also make sure that they've been in contact with their lender to see if the last thing that they, if it's been a couple months, um, to make sure they have their numbers right. Got it. Mm-hmm. Yep, that was definitely gonna be my recommendation to have your clients reach out to lenders um, to make sure that everything's in order so that they can just hit the ground running. Um, But I think December is a great time to reach out to all clients in your database. Just reach out to everybody, give them the information um, that we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks, especially about the interest rates. And the ones that respond back favorably, they're the ones that you wanna focus on. Um, Other ones you can nurture them through, but I think just lining up everyone that's in order of uh, readiness to transact is going to be your best game plan and really stay in constant contact with those folks you have to update them weekly if not you know just every very very frequently Um, and then by january and february you're going to be you have a really really good game plan in place and you're going to be busy very busy i agree i would say for me personally because i've had some buyers in the springtime we've submitted some offers lost out because it went 100000 above. Um, and now I'm telling them, like, this is the perfect time to buy again because do you want to be stuck in that same situation we were in in the springtime? And also I think, like, I would definitely want to do, like, a video email as well and send out more market data like this because a lot of them don't know what's going to happen next year. And I think to prepare them mm-hmm. is the best option. I, I love all this. And I would say this isn't just for buyers. This is for sellers as well. Like, hey, how are you going to prep your home? And if anyone's thinking about making a move up, they want to move before June 30th, they should be meeting with someone now. And this is the thing a lot of consumers don't do. They either wait till the last minute or agents don't know that a strategy session or a planning meeting is going to go a long way. Because if you can meet with them first as an agent, you've got a 70 plus percent chance of converting the client, number one. And secondly, these homes, it can take three, four, five months to get ready for the market because they've been in them so long. So I'd be looking at anyone that's thinking about a move in the first half of the year. I'd be trying to get in front of them, have a face-to-face meeting, a strategy session, a planning meeting, and just you know educate them about the market and how you can help them. And if you do that and you can meet as many people as possible over the next 30 days, you're going to come into 2023 with a ton of momentum. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. All right. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about Zillow and NAR going at it again. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB, 860 AM. For the best local mortgage service and great rates on your money, look no further than Mortgage America. We have been operating in the greater Philadelphia area for 40 years with a focus on smooth, easy access to home purchasing. Whether you're a first-time buyer, upsizing or downsizing, or just refinancing, we have programs for you. We also have closing cost assistance programs and access to subsidized interest rates. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. To learn more, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 
610-439-8000. We always have a person available to take your call with around-the-clock human service. Purchase your home with the personalized local service you find at Mortgage America. Mortgage America is an equal housing lender. NMLS 128501. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. The Tom Tool Sales Group is the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania with over $165 million in volume for 2021. I'm Tom Tool, and our team has achieved that kind of success by being a great place to work with and to work for. No one knows Greater Philly better than we do. We know real estate, but more importantly, we're real people. We hire the best agents, and we give them all the tools to succeed. Even our brand new agents sell 17 to 24 homes a year because our team delivers the best experience in real estate. Teams deliver a better experience than individuals, and we're a top 1% real estate team in the country. We call it AAA service. We're your advocate, ally, and advisor. Because this isn't a transaction to us. It's a relationship. If you're buying or selling a home, call the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Main Line at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. That's Tom, Tool with an E, dot com. Sell your home for more, and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. When you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. At Mortgage America, we've been lending with this philosophy for over 35 years. We have access to great low rates without the complications and delays of big or online banks. We're a local Pennsylvania lender with loan officers that you can actually meet. As PHFA's number one lender, we specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first-time buyer programs and low down payment options. For your free pre-approval, call us at 610-439-8000 or apply online at mymortgageamerica.com. Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Stacy Mitchell. She's Sarah Timon. And we've got Zara Salah in the house as well with Nick behind the camera. And we all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we're streaming live on this show every week on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Just look up Tom Tool Sales Group, subscribe, and follow. So Zillow is in the news again. And it seems like every time these guys say something, like the, the, the news gets picked up. Are, are they that newsworthy every time they have an opinion come out that should be on the front page of Inman? This is just a question. What, what, do, you, what do you guys think? Well, they are uh, the number one tool that buyers go to first. Like 99.9% of buyers and sellers, yeah. they, they first of all, they estimate their house, mm-hmm. right? Everybody does that. And then buyers, what, where do they go? You know, Zillow, like that yeah. funny Saturday Night Live skit. You know, it's yeah. true. So I think, yes, they probably, if they, you know, make a statement, it's going to be picked up. For Aren't sure. they worth like $7 billion, right, Zillow? They're a big company. I think They're that's publicly around. traded, so let's get the right numbers here. So let's look up their market cap because I, th- these Wall Street companies are, it's, I, I think it's, it's interesting how they how they uh, get valued. So Zillow's got an $8.37 billion market cap. Oh, that's pretty good. So, um all right, so you think it's newsworthy. I tend to agree with you, Stacey, uh, because they are such a relevant player in the real estate market, and consumers know Zillow way more than they know a lot of other brands. So uh, news came out uh, yesterday that Zillow has petitioned the NAR, the National Association of Realtors, twice to end the rule that allows MLS services to prohibit bro- brokers from displaying MLS listings with non-MLS listings online. So basically like a for sale by owner or a, you know, a private citizen. Uh, they, they can or these, these non-MLS brokerages like Rex, who we talked about a lot, they can list their homes on the same site. So this rule, it's subject to an antitrust lawsuit that was brought by discount brokerage uh, Rex against Zillow and NAR because the NAR rule prompted Zillow to separate non-MLS and MLS listings on its website. So what do you think about this? What, like, what, do, what do you think about this rule? Uh, is, is it relevant here? Is Zillow right? Is NAR right? Like, how, how do we land on this? I don't know. I can kind of see it going. Like, I can, I can see both sides of it. Like, it is nice being able just to, you know, if you do one search, being able to pull up everything and not having to go into like different filters to find your yeah. for sale by owners and your um, all of that. But um, but then you would really have to go through the weeds to determine if this is a property that you would be able to to get into and mm-hmm. to show your clients. Because I know with for sale by owners in particular, it can be tricky 
getting like lining up a time and and getting in there and finding out if they will cooperate with you and um you know it's it's always it's almost like surprising when you reach out to a for sale by owner and they pick up the first time and then they give you information and Mm -hmm. like give you a time that you can come in Mm -hmm. yeah that's definitely not the norm right yeah it's actually um pretty difficult uh working through a transaction Mm -hmm. with a for sale by owner you do end up doing a lot of extra work because they really have no clue what's mm-hmm. going on. Um, and it can be very, very frustrating. And they tend to think that you can overstep your boundaries on, I'm representing somebody else. I'm not representing you. Yep. I can't disclose that information or share those details. Right. Um, I'm going through that right now, so it's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah, they had a discount broker list their home. Okay. Yeah, in Florida. So, But it is a FISBO in essence. And... Um, you know, it, it's just very interesting go, going through this process. So while I understand Zillow's side of it too, um, yeah, I think, and it is tough, you're not gonna be able to keep information from people. Um, but I also think that Zillow's not finished. They're gonna continue this process. They're gonna do, they're gonna request again and again and again until they get what they want. It's just what they're gonna do. Um, because they even stated that change often takes time. Mm-hmm. And um, and member education. So they're going to continue to educate members of NAR, NAR uh, until they get what they want. So here's the statement from Zillow. This comes from Matt Hendricks. Uh, Matt Hendricks is the Senior Director of Broker Operations at Zillow. So Inman asked him what specific change the no commingling rule is Zillow advocating for? Why is Why this change? So Matt responded, Zillow wants to improve the online home buying shopping experience for consumers nationwide, and one of the best ways to do that is by removing the NAR's so-called no commingling rule. This optional model rule has been adopted by many MLSs across the U.S. and requires specific categories of non-MLS listings, like buildable home plans, auctions, manufactured homes, and for sale by owner to appear separately from MLS listings. For consumers, the separation of listings can add friction to a comprehensive home search where all listings appear together. Removing the rule is a win for buyers and the agents who represent them, who would be able to more easily find additional options, as well as sellers who will receive better exposure on their listings. Improving the search experiences become even more important in an extremely tight market with limited inventory. We ask this rule be amended, um, and we want to see uh, an attribution for the source of listings uh, that are listed on the MLS for better transparency. So, you know, hearing that, I mean, this is the kind of the same rhetoric you get from Zillow all the time. They want to build the super app. They want to have a better experience for buyers. I, I, I get all that. And, and so I, I understand where, where they're coming from. And one of the things about NAR, I mean, they have the, these rules they make up, like the clear cooperation rule. Like that one to me is, is garbage. Um, we follow it because we're members of NAR. But telling a seller, oh, you can't, list your home quietly with me unless you sign this form and I can only market it to my office now. I mean, it's basically saying, why don't you go FISBO instead of use an agent? Because there's other strategies besides, you know, besides just putting it on the MLS and hoping somebody shows up. In fact, that's usually a pretty bad strategy if that's all you're doing. So it seems like Zillow's like advocating for the greater good. What they really want, they want more people going to their website. That's, that's their goal here. They want the super app. They want to control all that stuff. So, you know, my, my view is I think it's very self-serving, but they're not coming out and saying that. And that's always been kind of the MO with them. Right. Like they're wording it in a way is like, no, this is to help the consumer. Mm-hmm. No, this is all for you. Yeah. You know, when like they have their reasons. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so then they asked, was there any other changes that uh, Zillow petitioned NAR to make to the MLS policies? Um they also uh, believe that brokerages will benefit from streamlined IDX rules and greater transparency than current rules allow. Many of the existing policies, policies around IDX, and that's Internet Data Exchange, are outdated and don't reflect current business models. Um, so, I mean, you know, they're, they're looking to change things up. They want more data on their website. They want all the homes there. They want to be the place to go. I don't think there's any other game plan here for them besides this. Um, and, you know, they do have a point that NAR just kind of makes up rules. And I, I think it, you're going to see a couple things happen. I could see agents and companies start to drop their realtor designation because they're not bound by the, you can still do business. Um, the challenge is you're going to be able to get into the MLS and do that sort of stuff. Um, our area is very realtor heavy, but I know other companies that just drop the realtor designation altogether. They don't need that. They can still operate in there. So this is going to be interesting because I think sometimes NAR, they do more to hurt themselves than anything else. 
Um, and they, they come up with these like cockamamie rules that are like, all right, well, we're, this is going to be the new rule now. But there, there's a problem with what's best for the consumer there. Even though they say that's one of the people they're looking out for, I don't know if that's always the case. Yeah, I was reading uh, a lot of his re- responses to the questions, and they're just very um, vague, yes. for lack of a better word. So the one answer, alongside being a champion for the consumer, we also believe that brokerages and agents will benefit from streamlined IDX rules and greater transparency than the current rules follow. But he doesn't go in to elaborate how. Like, mm-hmm. how is this going to help the agents and the brokerages? Um, yeah, most of his answers are extremely vague. Sounds like a politician. Yes, he exactly. Like <laughs> so, you know, w- with all this, I mean, it, w- w- you had to pick a side here. Like, should the commingling rule stay or go? Which, w- 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 which is going to be better here for, or w- which would you like to see? Well, I, 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 I'm happy with the system the way it is now. Yeah, that's what I was. Yeah, inside. I don't really have many issues with it right now. Right. Mm-hmm. I you know, also hate the word commingling, but that's. <laughs> so I mean, you can you can get as a for sale by owner, you can get on the MLS. Like you get pay five hundred bucks, yeah. have the MLS placement fee there. It's not like this doesn't happen, and then that gets you on Zillow and everywhere else. I think what Z- what Zillow was looking at one, they were getting sued by Rex, so I think that was one of the issues, and you know the fact that. You, you can still get on the MLS as a, as a for sale by owner. So I, I don't I don't buy into all this. Like we've seen it happen. It, it happens all the time. Uh, so I, I don't I don't totally agree with that. And I think that the challenge here is Zillow's got to decide if they want to be a portal or a brokerage, because a portal is come here, look at websites, do all this stuff. A brokerage is you know they accept referral fees. We're flex partners. We've been very open about that on on the show. You know, brokerage is a bit different, and you have different interests as a brokerage. And the challenge with Zillow is they've got to either prioritize the agents and the consumers or just the consumers. It, it can't be, well, we only prioritize agents sometimes and not others. So it, it's they got to make a decision here. And I think they're trying to walk the line without saying anything, to your point, um, and, and just kind of try to please everyone. And that, that that's what makes me a little nervous here is I don't know that they uh, like uh, their end game to me is still how do we – take more or cut people out of the transaction. I don't think it's anything more than that. Yeah, I, I think they want the whole pie. No, there's no doubt. I think they want everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and if they can cut us out somehow and become like the the, nas- the nationwide brokerage firm. Yeah, they love it. Right. Yeah. Well, think about what they're saying in this article here. We want different rules around IDX and all that stuff. I mean, and, and you're never going to get that because, I, I, I mean, I think the, the the laws are just different in every state. Like there, there, there's a, there's an issue there with some states require this, some states require that. New York City doesn't even have an MLS, right? So it's it's very different in a lot of places. So I, I do agree. They want to be the place to go for real estate, and I think that 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 it's that simple. All right, so we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about Zara. She onboarded with our team just about 12 months ago. Want to? She had tremendous success over in what's been a you know pretty interesting year with the market shifting and everything happening so quickly. So we're going to talk all about Zara next. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB, 860 AM. You shouldn't have to deal with all the red tape when getting your mortgage from a big or online bank. At Mortgage America, we have access to big bank money, but with the personalized and detailed service of a local bank. We are here in your community and ready to serve with fast settlements, low down payment options, and first-time homebuyer programs. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. For more information, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610 610- Zero four three nine eight thousand. I'm Tom Tool of the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline. If you're thinking of becoming a real estate agent in the greater Philly area, I have a special offer for you. Our team did $165 million of volume in 2021, making us the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania and a top 1% team nationally. Our agents love us because we offer them a successful career, a great life, and an unbeatable culture. Agents who've been with us for at least a year average 30-plus sales. Even our brand-new agents average 17 to 24 sales a year. We offer proven systems and expert training. We help you set more appointments and sell more houses. Now, here's the offer. If you don't have a real estate license yet, we offer real estate scholarships so you can get one for free. Check it out at realestatescholarshipprogram.com or visit the Tom Tool Sales Group at Remax Mainline at tomtool.com. That's tomtoolwithane.com. Get more out of your real estate career and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. 
When you're getting a mortgage, you shouldn't have to sacrifice great service just to get a great rate. At Mortgage America, we've been lending with this philosophy for over 35 years. We have access to great low rates without the complications and delays of big or online banks. We're a local Pennsylvania lender with loan officers that you can actually meet. As PHFA's number one lender, we specialize in all residential mortgage programs, including first-time buyer programs and low-down payment options. For your free pre-approval, call us at 610-439-8000 or apply online at mymortgageamerica.com. All right, all right. We are back. Back on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time and she's Stacey Mitchell. We've got Nick behind the camera and we have super agent Zara Salah in the house. Just got done her first 12 months in real estate, is having tremendous success, selling way more agents or way more real estate than the average agent in this short time here, which is really grateful to have you. And again, we're streaming live every week, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Just look up Tom Tool Sales Group, and we've been the number one team at REMAX in Pennsylvania since 2018. So, Zara. First of all, Zara doesn't have social media. So if you want to get in touch with her, it's zara.tomtool.com. It's Z-A-H-R-A dot tomtool.com. And tell us a little bit about your background. What did you do before real estate? You know, kind of fill us in there and then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk to you about what's happened over the past 12 months here. Yeah. So prior to real estate, I graduated from Penn State um, last year in May and my major was risk management real estate. So I kind of knew I always wanted to get into real estate in some form or another. I didn't know if I wanted to go into banking, like commercial real estate banking or a different kind of outlet. So I was just kind of, you know, I graduated college and I was luckily able to take my exam immediately. Well, actually, let me backtrack. I did a nine month long bank internship um, and it was like a typical nine to five. And then they did offer me a couple positions in June time. So I had like a six month gap where I was like, well, I've always kind of wanted to get into real estate and see if I would like it or not. So I took the exam. I didn't have to do the 75 hour coursework because my degree luckily let me be able to take it. So I took the exam and then I started. I only really planned to do it for like six months. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then, um, but then I just ended up really honestly loving it. And it kind of came to a point where I think I was like three months or something in. And I, you know, they were asking me, or like, are you going to accept the offer for the banking um, the program? And I was like, well, I can accept it and then decline. But I feel like if I always have that in the back of my head as a backup option, I'm not going to pursue real estate completely, you know, 100%. Mm-hmm. So I kind of got rid of that option and told them no and decided, like, I really love this. And I want to pursue it more. So, Love it. So so what made you decide real estate over banking? So I just, at first, I was very neutral to banking. I was fine with that. I didn't really have any issues. But then I got into real estate, and I fell in love with it completely because it's not a 9 to 5. I'm not staring at a computer screen for 8 hours. I'm not answering to somebody or having someone tell me, oh, these are my like tasks I need you to do today. Um, every day is completely different. I make my own hours. I'm my own boss. And I get to meet so many people along the way and help them. And that was something that I couldn't really do in banking. It was kind of just talking to a computer screen pretty much. Um, and I'm just very personable. I talk a lot. I know, shocker. <laughs> so like just getting to meet people and building connections with them was just perfect. Also, submitting an offer and getting a deal is like the best adrenaline rush for me. Yeah, there is nothing like there is getting nothing the, like, it. like call that you that you oh were my gosh, yes. was accepted. Yeah. I like internally scream, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh yeah. That's good. So tell us about the the real estate and risk management major because I, I there's not a lot of real estate majors out there. And I'm curious what you actually learned versus like what you're doing here, because I think this is a big, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people don't really know what they're getting into. Um, and there's probably people listening that, what am I, well, excuse me, what am I going to do next? And, you know, that, that's that's a great thing to kind of explore. Yeah, I really liked my major. It's fairly new. I think it started in like 2017. And I also talked to this with your dad as well. He had the same major. Um, and it's really cool because you get to explore different options. Like I could use financing for my major, or obviously real estate or different things like that. Um, so with my courses, they were very like law based, which I think is why I, I qualified to just take the exam because a lot of it's real estate law. So I learned a lot about real estate pretty much in general. To be honest, risk management, like even though it was my major, I didn't really learn much about it. Like all I learned is about probability trees. I don't even know what that is. But um, <laughs> so most of it was just like real estate heavy. So kind of real estate law and then math based things like that and then it was more finance as well Mm -hmm. um so my major is kind of a mix of multiple majors at once to be honest which is pretty cool 
And then do you think that was able to like translate pretty well into like you're actually using the things that you learned in what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like we all took the exam. You don't use everything on the exam Mm -hmm. that you use. And so I wanted to get in that in-person experience and see if I liked it for what it was. And obviously it helps to a certain degree with knowing like the laws and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that definitely helped a bit for sure. Awesome. Are you using any of this now? A year later. The courses that I took? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, um, like in terms of just knowing certain guidelines and things like that, or just it helped me a lot with my exam, obviously. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I passed it. <laughs> Very cool. So, you know, Knowing what you know now, I mean, it, 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 and I, I think, you know, I, I have a very similar story, and I think a lot of people, they don't want to be, like, behind the office, like, not talking to people. So the, I, I do agree the feeling of a deal. You said it's, like, it's 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 a good feeling because you're helping people and you're actually get, getting something done a lot of people can't do. Yeah. So w- looking back on it now, like, I mean, it, it's, it's – what sort of, like – when, when you look at the difference and what, what attracts you to people, what, what is that what gets you up in the morning? Like, talk a little bit about that, because I think you have to be wanting to engage with folks yeah. to even like, like this job or be successful yeah. at it. So I, when I first started, I kind of just met with everyone, and I feel like that kind of was a pit for me. And one of the reasons why I was so up and down with real estate is because I was meeting with, you know, kind of clients that weren't that nice and clients that were super picky or clients that were amazing. So I've become a lot more pickier as I've moved forward because I don't want it to affect my mental health at the end of the day. I want to work with clients that are going to be, you know, a pleasure to work with. And obviously you're going to deal with clients that aren't that great. But at the end of the day, like I want to help out the people that, you know, like first time home buyers, you know, like that's a big purchase for them, helping them out. People that are looking to downsize, you know, people with motivation that I feel like have a great story that I would love to help out with. So. So. What, what do you look for in a client? What do I look for in a client? Um, well, I think it's a two-way, you know, like they have to like me and I have to want to work with them as well. You know, I'm not just offering them my services. I also want to see what they're about as well. Um, so I kind of look for someone that's obviously motivated, that, you know, has, you know, a good background, things like that, obviously. Um, and just, yeah, a, a good, simple person to work with. I think it's pretty easy to be a nice person, honestly. <laughs> some people aren't great at it, but I just like, because so, I've had some clients that just treat me like a robot and not right. a person, you know, and if I don't give them the answer they're looking for or not what they want, they just treat me like a robot. And so I just like to be looked at as a person, which right. I don't think is that hard. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's interesting all the different people that you meet in this yes, business. Yes, you yeah. meet a wide yeah. range yeah. of people for sure. Yeah. yeah. So when it is nice as you're as you've been in it longer and you as you get more experience and as your pipeline grows, being able to say no to people that exactly. aren't a good fit. Because like I have that early, right. Early on, you had like you're like I will. Yeah. I will work with the biggest jerk in the world because yeah. like exactly. I need to. Yeah. I need to work with people yeah. right now. Um, and it's nice when you're able to be like, you know what? This isn't working. Yeah, because yeah. you don't want to be stepped on. Right. I think that's important and to it does. Like value it, yourself. Right. And it, like what you said about mental health is very true. Like yeah. that's just as important, if not more than like the paycheck. You know? I agree like, completely. You don't want to be like stressed out to the max every night and like yeah. every morning the first thing be like, oh my gosh. What's going to happen with this client today? Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, like if I generally like a person, I want to generally find them a home. Mm-hmm. And I don't have that money hungry concept in my mm-hmm. head. Mm-hmm. But you have that if you don't like them, you know, I'm like, I'm only doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm like, right. I want the paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> so that helps. Well, th- when you lead generate, you don't have to tolerate. Right. Yeah. And I think that's and, and but so, so many people don't want to do that. And then they get stuck working with just whoever's yeah. like there and. It, it's a big challenge right now for, for, for a lot of folks. So I think that's that, that, that's a great way to look at it. So what do you think some of the keys to your success? I mean, you've closed uh, right around $5 million in business in about 11 months, which is awesome. That's more than most people ever, like, ever sell. Make sure they're out of the business before that. So good job. Just um, the tip of the iceberg. Well, I agree. And we were talking about this over the weekend. Yeah. What do you think some of your keys to success are? I mean, especially like it's like at the beginning, you're just trying to do a deal, right? Exactly. And I think we've all been there. But yeah. what, like knowing what you know now, what, what has served you well and what are some things you might have wanted to do a little better when you got into the business? Yeah, I think just asking all the right questions has worked tremendously. Even today, we're talking about, you know, sometimes buyers don't know what they want and helping them realize that. So if that means broadening their search a bit, then that's what I do. And I ask all those important questions because sometimes they'll be like, oh, we want a three bedroom. I'm like, are you sure? Like, could you do a two bedroom? And they're like, well, actually, um, and then they change their mind. 
So it's always asking the right questions, seeing their motivation, because in the beginning, I was just kind of meeting with everyone, and they could, say, be in a lease for, like, a year and a half and not get out of it, and I would still show them houses. Mm -hmm. And that was a waste of time because they need some time, so I kind of put them on the back end, and I'll still reach out to them. But having those buyers that I know are motivated and ready to go now, um, you know, some things I didn't recognize in the beginning is motivation. I didn't know Mm -hmm. what motivated buyers were. My first ever deal I got, they were so motivated, but I found that to be insanely annoying. (laughs) Because I didn't know, like, it was normal for, like, buyers to just blow up your phone at all times of the day and be like, hey, we want to see this, we want to see that, and then call me. I'm like, leave me alone. Like, Mm -hmm. you're annoying me. But then I realized when we got a deal, I was like, oh, wait, they were actually just motivated the whole time. Like, duh. Right. Um, And it turns out that's way (laughs) it turns out that's way better than the ones that like don't pick up, don't answer, don't get back in touch with you. And now I realize moving forward, like anytime a buyer blows up my phone like that, I'm like, that's a good buyer. That's a good sign. Yeah, that's Mm -hmm. a that's a deal right there. Yeah. So for sure. So what what are some of the questions you ask people? Like you say, ask them the right questions. Like give us some examples. So could you tell me a little bit more about why you're making the move? What's your timeline like? Just so I know if they say ASAP, like I obviously know as soon as possible, you know, and um, just kind of like more information about them, their motivation. If there's like a death or divorce, that's motivation. Um, If they have a lease, I ask them, like, can you get out of your lease? Is it month to month? Like, questions like that, especially about locations and beds, baths. You know, like I said, some people say, we need a four-bedroom. Like, do you really need it? And then they'll be like, actually, three-bedroom in a basement is fine. I'm like, okay. So you always want to ask. And sometimes I guess I could be a little bit annoying with the questions, but then they really open up, and I feel like that's when you kind of get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I mean... we, obviously, when you're going through your first year in real estate, there's a lot of ups yeah. and downs. So, how have you managed like that roller coaster of emotions? Because I know that's something I think a lot. I mean, we've probably all gone through it at the table here. And when, when you can do that and kind of be a little more like routine based, it helps. But how, how do you how do you deal with that? Because I think a lot of people get stressed out. Like they don't realize like yeah. there, there's it's not a high pressure job, but it's performance based. Like <laughs> well, I, th- I think you have to know what to say and, and know how to manage your time and do some other things. Um, so, ha- what, what, did, how did you manage that? Because I mean, like you said, you you got annoyed at your first set of clients that bought a house because they were motivated, but maybe you just didn't know what the signs were. Yeah, exactly. And I still uh, struggle with that to this day because obviously, you know, dealing with a deal and some things go wonky, I get a little emotional or carried away. Um, but I honestly just relied on my team really heavily, like you and then you know my friends on the team josh like people like that to kind of really calm me down if because i always have to you know if there's things that go honky or wait whatever during like a deal i kind of have to calm down my clients but then i need someone to calm me down so then i'll call up you or josh or anyone (laughs) i'm like guys help me i'm freaking out and then that helps me and then i go back to them i'm like all right like let's you know and i give them the advice and i feel like that has really helped with the highs and lows is just having my team to rely on and i don't know how agents that are like go independent deal with all of that by themselves because even you know our back staff like Angela and stuff like that she helps me so much Mm -hmm. and that really helps as well you know because I feel like at the end of the day I can always rely on them as well Mm -hmm. and I feel like the manager kind of whenever I get a deal and they can kind of help me and obviously it's up to me I'm held liable but to have people that help me as well yeah when I think that more transactions than not, whether or not the aid, the mm-hmm. client is aware of like how sideways things could have gone or yeah. some of the like they don't always realize everything that happens on on the back end. But yeah. in most transactions, something's going to happen along the way that's okay. going to require figuring something out. It yeah. could be small. It could be big. And being able to go to a team and being able to go to people that have had that situation before and say, hey, this like this is the problem. Here are the solutions. Yeah. And then being able to go to your client and say, hey, yeah, we've got a problem, but this is what we can do about it. This exactly. is the steps. It like takes the pressure off of them. You yeah. know, it's just kind of like, yeah, this is normal. We're going to figure it out. Um, yeah. And when I first started out, you know, I obviously didn't have any experience. So I was using the team's experience. Like someone would tell me a story and I would use it mm-hmm. for my client, just make it my own because yeah. how, how would they know? You know, right. it is mm-hmm. someone close to me. Yeah. So I feel like that helped as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the case studies always work because yeah. uh, and I, it, it shows that you're actually really in the field and, and helping people. So um, you talked a lot about relying on the team. And I, I know you've had some times where like you felt I, I think you had some like transactions that really got to you. So um have you guys ever cried over a real estate transaction? Yes. Yes? I have never cried. I, don't, don't I haven't cry. either. All right, so it's 50-50. But I, I, I've held on to it a little bit too long. I haven't, like, right. legitimately the cried. Five, five I've been funeral. close. Yeah. yeah. I, 
Especially on the phone with him. I, was, I saw you in my office one day, so we'll just uh, we'll, we'll chalk that up to what it is. The uh, one that I did fool out cry about, though, in my defense, I was pretty pregnant. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use that as that. But there was there was one that I can think of in particular, and it wasn't the client; it was the agent on the other side. It was the lender oh, for me. That, the lender oh, yeah. really got yeah, to me. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I wanted to get to. Yeah. Sometimes it's the yeah. other people you're dealing yeah. with it's that you're relying on their expertise. The buyer, yeah. Right. yeah. So, well, I think it's tough because you you get so invested with these people, and you and, and you get there, and then someone else like drops the ball. And I'm a control freak. So and absolutely not. Well, you couldn't control it though, and I yeah. think that that's the point. So, um, you know, I mean, it's happened to all of us, where right? I think, and, and you know, maybe you hold on to it too long, or like you keep a list of people, you you make sure like my clients will never work with you because I don't want them to have this bad experience. I know I have that list mentally in my head right now. So I have that list. <laughs> you broke down like. Did that make you stronger? Like, because I think a lot of people aren't like willing to have those experiences. They just they, they can't deal with it. Mm-hmm. I think that, and what I'm clear on is that, especially in the 2023 market we're coming into, if you're battle tested like that, and just once is all you need. You don't need to have more than once. Um, I mean, some people might, but yeah. I, I don't. I don't know that anyone here does. Do you feel like that's going to make you stronger? And like, what do you know now that you wish you would have known a year ago that's going to help position you to have a monster 2023? Yeah, I agree. So I, I'm kind of a control freak. So just realizing that some things like are going to be out of your control, like a annoying lender or, you know, certain circumstances, inspection, whatever, like that's out of your control. But all you can do is really advocate for your buyers. And that's what I've been trying to do. Um, some of my buyers have a little bit outrageous requests at times. And I'm kind of like, I get a little emotional because I'm just like, Ugh. But, you know, you just kind of have to calm down a bit and just, like, I take kind of like a breather at times. And sometimes, because I want to pick up the phone immediately and, like, do something, and sometimes I have to hold myself back and be like, you know what, let me take, like, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, figure myself out, calm down, maybe talk to you, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then get back to it. Because sometimes I just, like, you know, before I would just kind of charge in immediately and try to handle it by myself. Um, but having people that I can rely on, even in that specific situation, I did not want to go out, like reach out to you, but then it got to a point where I had to, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's best to not do everything by yourself, even though I can be stubborn and a control freak. Um, so yeah, this feels like a therapy session. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes that 10 or 20 minute break yeah, and mm-hmm. stepping it can away. Help yeah. So really much. just like go watch Real Housewives and exactly, then go back. Something and, and then yeah. come back and then you realize, okay, it's not as big. As exactly. I'm right. like, okay, mm-hmm. I'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So last question here, because we're about to wrap up. We're going to get the music here soon. So what advice do you have for someone that wants to get into real estate? I mean, you've done it. Uh, you were considering another career yeah. and you said, you know what? Screw this. I'm sticking with what I did, which I, I, I think sometimes you got to test some stuff out and see how it goes. I don't, I think people are afraid to test out careers and when, especially coming out of college, like if you lose six months, not the end of the world. And when you get to be my age and you lose six months, it's a different story, right? I, well, time is time is an issue. You got to look at your situation. So that person's maybe afraid to get into the business or isn't quite sure. What advice do you have for them? Because obviously you've turned this into a career. Maybe you didn't even think that was going to be the case when you walked in the door. So I would just say, you know, first of all, like if you are interested in real estate, I recommend pursuing it because you never know. And I always had that. Like I didn't want to have that regret of not pursuing it and seeing what happened. I also think it's important to pick a trustworthy brokerage. I didn't really do much research, honestly. And so I like I found you on Indeed. But like I'm so, I got lucky, honestly, because I, I didn't know the difference between a team and an independent agent. A team offers you so much more. And I needed that, especially in the beginning. Like you need someone to train you. And those meetings that we have always help. So I would just say pick a reliable brokerage that you trust, a team preferably, because I do think that helps a lot. Then, you know, if you want to go independent, go independent later, but at least you have the resources that helped you um, in the beginning. And then give it six months, I would say. Like, I feel like that's a good time frame. You kind of know at that point if you're going to make it or not or if it's for you. Love it. So you want to get in touch with Zara. It's zara.tomtool.com. She's the last person in the U.S. without a social media account. Z-A-H-R-A dot TomTool dot com. That's it for this week's episode, Zara. Thanks for coming on. Really grateful for you. Really value here at, at, at our organization. You want to follow Stacy? She's at the number two Mitchco on Instagram. Sarah's at Ty underscore Ty Time on Instagram. You can follow me at TomTool 3RD. And every week we are streaming live. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Just look up TomTool Sales Group. Subscribe. Follow, and we'll be back next week with another episode of Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM.